All right. Okay. So we'll get started with our questions for each other. Okay, Victoria, where did you grow up? I grew up in Decatur, Alabama. So just about an hour and 45 minutes north of here. Have you ever left Alabama? Or? I have. I um, lived in Melbourne for about a year and a half or two years, okay. but mostly I've just lived in Alabama. Well, it's a so. wonderful place. Yes. What about you? Um, I was born in Rochester, New York and lived there for a few years and then um, was raised in Maryland, in the mid-Atlantic and lived, um, went to undergrad and lived in DC for a long time oh, and um, went to graduate school at UAB, met my husband who lives in, who is from Mississippi and we lived there for a bit and settled in Birmingham. And okay, I was going to ask what brought you to Birmingham, but that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So, um, I actually met my husband through a study abroad program, like a friend of a friend. Mm -hmm. So who knew that studying overseas would end up bringing me to the South to live? So, so did you guys both study in the same country? No, I, um, I studied in London and I met a friend, like we became quick friends and it was- I like, see what you mean. Yeah, the first person I had ever met from Mississippi and we became best friends. and her now husband's friends um, is my husband. So. Oh, how funny. I actually met my husband. Well, I met his sister first at college. She was the first friend I made at college. Oh. And um, I actually met him through a student organization. And she's like, oh, my brother's in that. And I was like, okay, yeah, yeah, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I had to go back later and tell her, oh, your brother oh, and I are dating now. <laughs> <laughs> I still want to be friends, but. Yes. And we still are. <laughs> That's awesome. All right, what has been, speaking of trips, what has been the best trip you have ever taken? I have to think about this one. I love to travel. Um, that's my hobby, so I love to, when I can, save up money and go places. Um, it's hard to pick a favorite. If I had to pick one, I would say probably Japan. We went to Japan five years ago and it was a really fun trip. I heard it's beautiful. Um, that was always my father's favorite place to go was Japan. He went really? a lot. Yeah, I have never been. I, I recommend it. Um, the people are very nice. The food I think is great. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot to see. There's a lot I haven't seen yet that I'd like to go back and check out. Awesome. Well, I'm in the same boat because there's so many great trips I've taken. Traveling is like my favorite thing, mm -hmm. um, which makes this season of life here <laughs> in the pandemic extra cold. difficult. Um, but I would say just for sentimental reasons, and it's probably my favorite city. Um, my mom and I, um, I promised each other a really special trip together because um, we had taken care of my father and his during a terminal illness. And we decided we really needed to do something like just escape. Mm -hmm. So it has a lot of sentimental value to me. And then we ended up loving the city. We went to Barcelona and spent a week uh -huh. there. And it was fantastic. Like everyone was so nice and it was the weather was perfect and all the sights and the food. <laughs> I've never <laughs> the food been. So really if there was one thing that you would say, you can't miss this if you go to Barcelona, what, what would you recommend? Oh gosh. Um, I'd say the Gothic city, um, just taking a walking tour through it, the old Gothic city. And there, I, this is, there's so many things to see, but this I thought was fascinating. We found in a travel book, this little, it's a synagogue, mm -hmm. um, one of the oldest synagogues in Europe, and it's kind of underground, like underneath um, mm -hmm. some houses, and they give you this excellent, for three euros, they give you this excellent history and description of um, the life back in, back when the Phoenicians had first come to um, that part of the world, and it was just, it was so interesting, so I would say, I always tell people to do that, of course, go see the big things, mm -hmm. but that was, that was pretty cool. Okay. Okay, what's our next question? Oh, <laughs> what's your favorite streaming show, like on Netflix or Hulu or Amazon and why? Of course, we go through a lot of shows just trying to find something to watch. Uh, as far as my favorite, I'm a nerd. I like a show called Firefly, which is from the kind of earlier mid-2000s, um, and it only had one season, but I really liked it a lot. So sometimes I'll just watch that just for the comfort of seeing something again. 
Is it like science fiction? I haven't even heard it of it. It is kind of sci-fi. Some people call it like a, a space western. Oh, kind of. okay. Um, it's a very interesting mix of the two genres. So it's it's by Joss Whedon, who um, worked in Buffy the Vampire Slayer for those, you know. Okay, back in the day. I like Buffy. But also he did some work on the Avengers. Um, so, wow. Yeah. What about you? What's one of your favorites? Uh, I, there's a lot I have liked. Um, I really enjoyed Fleabag, but I would say probably like all around my favorite is The Americans. I've heard that's good. It's so good. And it's, um, it reminds me because it takes place in the eighties in Washington, DC, mm-hmm. and that's near where I grew up. Mm-hmm. And it reminds me of my childhood a lot. Not that my parents were Russian spies. They were not. <laughs> <laughs> but we, as kids, we used to wonder because it was during the end of the Cold War, like we used mm-hmm. to wonder, oh, are they spies? Because mm-hmm. that was just a thing, like this apartment buildings where you knew people who wanted to spy on the Pentagon lived in. I don't even know if any of that was true, but it was just part of our childhood. Mm-hmm. And so it was really interesting, I thought. And the show was just really well done, good acting, and um, could be a little violent, just <laughs> disclaimer. I need to bump that up on my to watch list then, because I definitely okay. have it on there. But. Well, it's good, it is good. All right, um, hardest part of the pandemic for you? Um, it is, for me, it's definitely been not getting to spend as much time with the people I care about the most. So not getting travel is hard, but I can deal with that. Um, but I haven't gotten to spend as much time with my parents. My parents are quarantining pretty well. Um, so, you know, not if I see them, it needs to be outside with masks on and that's just difficult. Um, but same thing, just, and my grandmother were, you know, to protect her, not spending as much physical time with her. Um, and my friends, I love to host gatherings, um, mm-hmm. just, dumb little excuses to get together like taste tests so we do things like I have everybody bring their favorite um Thai soup from one of the restaurants around and we'll do a a blind taste test and you know little fun social gatherings like that that are just really not possible right now so that's been the hardest part for me is not getting to actually connect in person with friends family and co-workers yeah I can relate to that how about you Um, what would you say I would say well, it weighing like the daily weighing of risk is mm-hmm. hard with two kids. My mm-hmm. children are almost nine and almost eleven, and just what can they do? What can they not do? And we've been taking it seriously. So then mm-hmm. we deal with, well, why all the kids up the street are doing X, Y, and Z? Why can't we? And we have the conversation about, well, your grandmother, who we like mm-hmm. to see, is high risk, and so we have to think about her. And I do think in some ways we are helping teach them about empathy, Mm -hmm. but they don't really understand that quite yet. (laughs) And it's just, and knowing just the stress of how, as a community, how are we going to get through this when it seems like a lot of people aren't really taking it as seriously as, Mm -hmm. as the rest of us. And it just gets frustrating. And so I think that all like becomes uh, it becomes like an emotional toll like mm-hmm. oh gosh here we go again like, <laughs> cases are going up again and neighbors are having big parties you know mm-hmm. it kind of stresses me out so. yeah yeah that makes sense are your you know if you feel like answering this I, I first have to say I really admire my co- colleagues I see on zoom calls and things like that and there's children in the background and that is a challenge I don't have and I very much admire all of those people who are trying to be professionals be parents and be educators of their children which is not what they normally have are your children doing a combination of virtual and in-person school or you guys totally at home we are so they were at home for months and we um again like I spent weeks doing the risk Right. Weighing exercise and with cases going down, well, they were going down and the safety protocols the school presented us with and our children's ages, Mm -hmm. we went ahead and decided to let them try in person school. And so they've been doing that for a few weeks and it's been going well. They've been great about wearing their masks. And um, that means now we don't see my mom. If we do, it's outside Mm -hmm. six to 10 feet apart masks. Um, but we have been preparing 
at home for the eventual, like if we end up uncomfortable or they get quarantined or right. school has to go virtual, we have um, some virtual things we've been working on and a tutor that they meet with on Zoom and those sorts of things to kind of get ready for that. So we'll see. We're taking it. <laughs> That's a lot to be thinking about on top of everything else. It, it is. I think we're like, we're getting used to it, but, <laughs> and I think about the families that, I mean, I'm, we're so lucky at UAB. I fully supported by our employer and given great options and we can work um, in a remote way um, and still get our work done and our colleagues mm -hmm. are responsible. And I just think I have a roof over my head. I can feed my kids. I, I think about the tough decisions parents have to make who might not have Wi-Fi in their home mm -hmm. or they have difficulty with transportation or they've lost their jobs and it's, yes. it's a lot. Yeah. Um, oh, we, we can end our last uh, question on something positive. Mm -hmm. Has this pandemic helped you experience any silver linings? Like what are, what's the upside? Are there sure. any upsides? <laughs> um, in the same way that I do miss connections uh, with people in person, so with colleagues, my students, I miss seeing them in person. I just really miss them being able to drop my, my office, um, things like that. But I, I actually really do enjoy working from home despite missing those connections. I, it has been a really nice experience to have the opportunity to get to work from home. And I'm grateful that UAB and my reporting line has allowed me to do that. Um, that honestly has helped me identify the parts of life I'm most grateful for. So those people interactions and kind of taking the time to slow down a bit and focus on what are the key aspects of my job? Um, and then what are the key aspects too of just the rest of my life? So I guess that disruption has given me, it's forced me to prior reprioritize in my job and in my personal life too. Um, so I guess, you know, if we're looking for silver linings, that is one for me. But what about for you? Um, well, I can relate to what you're saying too. It's like, it was so strange at first to be working from home, but it does allow you the chance to prioritize things a bit. You know, like if I had to take a break to do something with the children, like I found that, wow, between four and six, I get some time mm -hmm. when they're exhausted. I get some time. I can really write during this time or I, just things I wouldn't experience had when you're just in the office this right. this amount of time and mm -hmm. um but I would say my silver lining as difficult as it has been it probably relates to the kids I remember um when I had them I had to go right back to work so my son started daycare at eight weeks and my daughter started daycare mm -hmm. at 10 weeks and I will fully admit that I was not the best infant mother like <laughs> That was a very difficult stage for me, but I still felt terrible about, felt like I was choosing work, do it, mm -hmm. or being with my children, and would they develop well if I wasn't around them all the time, and they yeah. did, they're fine, but <laughs> um, I, I got some, we, when they were sent home in the middle of March, and we were all figuring things out together, we took nature walks, we sat in the backyard at the end of the day, we made s'mores more often, we had movie nights, we did this fun thing during, well, I thought it was fun, I'm not sure that they loved it, but we, during the summer, because all their summer camps were, camp, their in-person mm -hmm. summer camps were mm -hmm. canceled, we pretended we were going to a different country every week, and we'd learn about the country and make something from the country, and it I was just, that. it was just a nice time, like, we got, I got to know them a little bit Mm -hmm. I know it sounds crazy. They're my kids. I know them really well, but I got to know them a little in a different way. And I, I mean, if you asked me in the middle of summer, I'd probably be tearing my hair out, but really and truly, I, there was a lot I really enjoy. And they come home, they don't have after school care anymore. So they come home earlier and they do their homework while I work and we're just getting to know each other in a different way and it's been kind of nice and I like yeah. sitting at sitting outside and we have a lot of wildlife in our backyard and watching rabbits mm -hmm. hop around at the end of the day when I'd usually be commuting yes um, I so, don't commute no <laughs> <laughs> it's traffic 
Um, but yeah, I, I like what you said too. I feel like we've, and even this is a, a demonstration of it is we have been able to work with our colleagues and to connect to each other and to get things done. And I think we've had to utilize creativity yeah. and especially when you all with the students, I'm just so impressed by everything you all have been able to do and to make UAB still an awesome experience. Yeah. So. It, like you said, it has been a challenge, but I think it helps that UAB has provided a lot of good communication um, because I have colleagues at other universities and no institution is perfect, but I do appreciate how much UAB has been communicating. The town halls and all that have been nice and, and producing guidance for, you know, as we're setting up classes and things like that. Um, having the CTL and e-learning, it's, it's been, that's taken off a lot of stress that I definitely would have had trying to help yeah. develop, you know, They're amazing. remote classes. So. Yeah. I have, I have colleagues at other universities as well. And everybody, I mean, like you said, not that no one's, no institution is perfect, mm -hmm. but I really have to say, every time I talk with one of them, I think I am so lucky to be at UAB. Yeah. Just like the medical expertise, yes. the great leadership. And yes. a friend of mine who teaches at a, or who works at a university in the Mid-Atlantic had said, I really love looking at the materials you all put together because UAB is building a community around this. Like mm -hmm. they're making this, this is like a part of their culture. Like we're going to work together. And mm -hmm. I thought, I really like that observation. It means that we're doing our job and communicating it, but it makes me feel even better about where we are. Same. <laughs> I'm very, I, I feel very lucky to be working at UAB during this crisis. Yeah, so. me too. Well, it was great talking to you. You too, Karen. It was nice to meet you virtually. I know. We've exchanged emails, but now I get to put a face with the email. Yeah.